Uh, my worry with the policy of strategic silence is that destroyers will innovate in ways to recapture the attention. Now, Tyler, I ran into an idea that I hadn't heard codified with and labeled with a phrase before um, called strategic silence. And I, I read about this in writings or speeches of Dana Boyd, uh, who works with uh, Data and Society Institute. The idea behind it is that if you have predictable, reliable news coverage, it allows somebody who, let's say, wishes to undertake a terrorist action to know that they can count on you to amplify their message because they have the ability to create news. They are not just news takers, but news makers. In that realm, the news media has been experimenting with the idea that they will not do the bidding of the attacker by broadcasting things about motive, about name, uh, or about certain circumstances of the crime, so uh, at least ostensibly as not to amplify the leverage of the attacker. Is that kind of a, a death knell for confidence in reporting that if we report the facts straight, we give people too much leverage over our news, and if we don't report the facts, then we quickly erode confidence in our system? I favor the experiment of not reporting the names of, say, mass shooters. I'm not sure we're really withholding facts. So the name of the person didn't mean anything to the audience in advance whether the person's name is John Smith or John Brown. It's, it's a fact in some way, but in another way, it's not a fact at all. Whereas if it's a person who is already known, say back, back then, Osama bin Laden, then you are withholding a fact. If you don't say Osama bin Laden had a role in 9-11. Uh, my worry with the policy of strategic silence is that destroyers will innovate in ways to recapture the attention. So if they don't report your name, maybe you kill more people, or maybe you innovate with a new method of killing people. So you might be inducing innovation over the medium term. And I don't think we know yet. As an experiment, it does seem to me worth trying, but I wouldn't be all too optimistic about it. Because as I say on my blog, like, solve for the equilibrium. And what's the equilibrium here? We don't quite know. Although with somebody like the Unabomber, uh, who left us a manifesto, or let's say the Christ Church uh, shooter in the mosque, we have uh, a fairly detailed account of what was going through the person's mind while they were committing their crimes. I don't know if that is what was going through their mind. It was what was going through their mind at some point in time. But was it their actual set of motivations? Uh, well, I don't they, feel qualified to judge, but I wouldn't just take that for granted or take it quite literally. But would you feel uh, comfortable in suppressing the dissemination of such a document? I don't think it's possible to suppress that at, uh, the way the internet and other institutions have evolved. I wouldn't do it either. Uh, but in any case, it will get out there. So if we decide, oh, it's not going to be on Facebook, uh, as you well know, there are other parts of the internet where it just can't be taken down. It's an interesting place where I think I disagree with you. I don't disagree with you that we can't stop uh, the document from being on the internet and a very determined person in their ability to find it. I do believe that there is a frictional coefficient that the search engines and the major platforms can control if they uh, so choose to slow down the flow of information and whether it gets reified and discussed inside of what I've termed the gated institutional narrative is a big deal because those news organizations react chiefly to each other and special trusted institutions. And so many of us still have the idea when we're listening to that conversation that it's an open conversation when, if you're in a position like you or I may be, we're astounded by the number of things that simply can't be discussed in, in, in that echo chamber and, and in those corridors. But I think the short term and the medium term are quite different here. So if Facebook and YouTube and Google all of a sudden decide they won't cover some awful video, uh, that will have real impact. But I think, say, four or five years later, there'll be some new set of tools. Maybe they're only used to find the really bad stuff. Uh, but people will know there are sites or methods where you can go see, hear, experience all the really bad things, and then it still gets out. So uh, I'm not at all opposed to people, say, who run Facebook deciding not to post something. I think it's fine. It's their website. Uh, more power to them. 
Uh, but at the same time, we should not infer too much from the short run reaction. Because again, solve for the equilibrium, institutions and searchers will adjust. So you and I have a slightly different orientation about that. It might be fun to play with it for a second. I think I've I used to hold a position that these companies had the right to do what they wanted. Yes. And I, I've started to change my opinion on that based on the idea that if I define the public space uh, relative to private space, I can find only private space on the internet. I, I need to hire a company to allow me to get an on-ramp in the form of an ISP, and that in general, uh, unlike a city uh, with parks and um, institutions of government, I really can't find any public space on the internet. And so if the whole thing is private, I feel like it's absolutely essential that we place much more restrictive um, rules about what can and cannot be prohibited on the internet because there is no public space from the get-go. Am, am I way off? The analogies of public and private space to the internet, I think, are quite complex. I would just start with a very simple question. Who is it you would trust in politics to make those decisions better than what our current internet is giving us? And for me, the answer is no one, no party, no institution. So I would like to keep things more or less the way they are now and have no liability for the internet companies, let them decide. And uh, the notion that Congress, did you see the recent, recent uh, testimony of Mark Zuckerberg before Congress? Caught a little bit of it, not much. It's remarkable how, how little people in Washington understand about tech at any level. So, so what explains this? You and I spend a fair amount of time in Silicon Valley, and it's not like the government couldn't get help from the world's smartest tech people. And they can and they do, but the actual decisions are made by Congress and by a president. But what explains the lousy level of questioning of tech people and you know, both scientific... The quality of voters, right? So people get the leaders they deserve. Voters are poorly informed. Representatives want to parade a certain display of toughness or strength in front of those voters. So they're deliberately rude to Mark Zuckerberg. They ask stupid questions, which voters will let them get away with. In my Twitter feed, some of the very stupidest questions were being applauded, say, by PhD economists. Like, oh, you know, get tough, you know, show Mark Zuckerberg. So even at that level, there's an expressive response that encourages this behavior, and that's why we get it. But when you then think, gee, this system is going to regulate speech on the Internet, I say, no way, you know. Zenger was right. Well, I think that's different. You ever watch giraffes fighting or bunnies? Uh, I've seen bunnies fighting on the internet. I mean, bunnies sure fighting seen... is amazing, right? It's like, I think I got this from Joe Rogan. Bunny UFC is just, it, it, they fight in such an intense fashion. I, I think people are cheering um, some of these hearings in the same way that they would cheer for like one rabbit over another. Of they course, it's like a cockfight. It's just, it's just interesting watching people beat up on each other, particularly if you like one more than the other. I don't think that people are anywhere near as stupid as, I don't think we're getting the government we deserve. And, and let me give you an analogy which is plaguing me uh, for many things. We used to think that TV was the idiot box. And we clearly just didn't understand long form television of the form that has been discovered with Game of Thrones uh, or The Sopranos. I think that there's a long form politics that we want and we're smart enough to know the difference between what we have and that. And we can't get it because it's really not in the interests of people who have more leverage than the rest of us.